environment restored in Myanmar. So MCN uh, includes trade unions, NGOs, uh, human rights organisations, Myanmar diaspora organisations and faith-based organisations, uh, all of whom have strong networks. And it's through this coalition that we also have access to international civil society organisations as well. And I think one uh, aspect of the value of civil society is the wealth of knowledge and experience in various sectors and also the, the willingness for international coordination. So we're seeing a lot of information sharing and uh, support. And um, we also have to remember that the, the situation in Myanmar, it's been exacerbated by the coup to what is the worst human rights uh, and humanitarian crisis in Southeast Asia. But the military have been uh, perpetrating atrocity crimes and violence for decades. So we also have activists from previous generations, from previous uprisings, who have capacity and experience and were able to mobilise very quickly. Uh, and I'd like to take the opportunity um, to congratulate the CRPH Energy Support Group Australia uh, that formed in 2021 uh, to support the legitimate government of Myanmar, the National Unity Government. It comprises 73 Myanmar diaspora organisations from uh, many different Myanmar nationalities, and it models democratic processes and inclusivity, and it also uh, models the ability and will for these diverse groups from Myanmar to coordinate towards a common goal. So that's really exciting. Um, so MCN works closely with Dr. Tunon Shui, who is the National Unity Government representative, representative to Australia. And our call for sanctions aligns with the calls uh, of the people of Myanmar. So along with uh, calls for a global arms embargo and you know, the UN's responsibility to protect the people of Myanmar have been calling for sanctions. And we saw very early in 2021 that the US, UK, EU and Canada acted swiftly to issue sanctions. And our call was that sanctions work as part of coordinated action and Australia should join our democratic allies. And we still maintain that it's in Australia's national interest and in our values of democracy and human rights to limit the power and influence of the Myanmar military uh, to support an end to violence and to support the return uh, of the democratically elected government. And at the time in 2021, we were calling for sanctions on the military leadership and on the financial resources of the Myanmar military. So those two big uh, military conglomerates, um, MEHL and MEC. And we we're also calling for sanctions on state-owned enterprises whose accounts are under the control of the military, particularly in lucrative uh, natural resources like oil and gas. So we were very excited um, when the Magnitsky style and other thematic sanctions act uh, passed in December 2021. Um, also on the 5th of March, uh, there were amendments to the Australia's autonomous sanctions regulation as well. But of course, at that time, Professor Sean Turnell, um, the Australian economic advisor to the Na uh, National uh, League for Democracy, was in custody. So he'd been in custody since the 6th of February 2021 and remained in custody for 650 days until the 17th of November 2022. And um, many speculated that obviously that was a reason that sanctions weren't issued at the time by Australia. So MCN and our uh, member organisations, we've undertaken various uh, actions from making representations to government, uh, obviously public rallies, petitions, photo pledge campaigns, letter writing campaigns, engaging with federal MPs, uh, and through persistent lobbying uh, <laughs> and advocacy, the Australian government did take that significant step earlier this year uh, on the 1st of February 2023 and announced uh, sanctions on 16 uh, Myanmar individuals and those two um, big military conglomerates. So um, it was a it was a, a long haul, uh, and um, I think it many many times along the way we were disheartened and 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 a little bit confused, to be honest, as to why Australia hadn't take, taken action sooner. But um, we certainly see that as a success and it was certainly impactful um, earlier in the year. And we thought that that would be the beginning of a, a series of um, uh, sanctions uh, being issued. Um, but uh, as, as we've found, uh, although our democratic allies have continued to issue sanctions, Australia at this stage has not and Australian sanctions only account for about 2% of international sanctions actions uh, on Myanmar. Um, and I'll talk a little bit later, maybe if we've got the opportunity about our, our current calls. Thanks. 
Thanks so much, Taz. Um, really wonderful reflections on your and MCN's advocacy. Um, I'll now turn to Simon. And Simon, as head of policy at Save the Children Australia, you have not only well, you were not only involved in the adoption of the Magnitsky legislation, but also in ongoing policy efforts since then, both in terms of possible listings or designations, and as well as bringing attention to challenges faced by humanitarian organisations operating in countries where sanctions have been imposed. Would you be able to elaborate on some of these challenges? faced by humanitarian organisations in the sanctions space. Yeah, great. Thank you, Mel, and thank you, ACIJ, for putting together this session. And it's uh, great to, to see so many familiar faces uh, uh, here on the call today. So. Uh, to begin with, when I'm talking about sanctions uh, for humanitarian organisations, they often see sanctions from a, a, a dual purpose. So um, firstly, the role of sanctions from an accountability perspective, and secondly, how sanctions uh, might be able to uh, be implemented to ensure that that humanitarian access uh, continues. So from the first perspective, looking at accountability, it's really important uh, to ensure that those who are involved in committing, overseeing and ordering violations of rights are brought to justice. Uh, and we know that that is often not possible. Um, perpetrators often have very little reason to fear uh, that they're going to be held accountability uh, for their crimes. Uh, and while there are a range of international legal measures that, that might be able to be taken by the International Criminal Court, the ICJ, International Court of Justice, or the UN Security Council, a lot of these mechanisms have lacked the expertise, scope, or capacity to investigate and prosecute crimes. And we're seeing a, a really challenging process of engaging on accountability through global decision making bodies, particularly uh, the UN Security Council uh, at the moment. So while there's certainly need for reform and uh, of some of these uh, mechanisms, uh, there is at the same time a need to look at alternative forms of uh, holding uh, perpetrators of violations uh, accountable. From a humanitarian organizational perspective, we have first-hand experience of what's happening on the ground. Uh, we see the devastating impact the conflict is having on children. Uh, and conflict is becoming increasingly more dangerous for children. Uh, in 2022, almost 3,000 children um, were killed across uh, 24 countries. Uh, and in Gaza alone over the last two months, um, the total uh, children who've been killed um, has uh, surpassed the number of children killed in the, in the last three years. Um, so accountability is critical uh, for these violations. Secondly, there's that component around uh, ensuring um, prompt response to emergencies and access to provide humanitarian assistance. So Save the Children, we operate in, in approximately 120 countries across the globe. Uh, we have over 25,000 staff. And so we're operating in every single humanitarian conflict situation you can think of, uh, whether that's in Myanmar, the DRC, the occupied Palestinian territories, Yemen, Syria, and many others. Uh, and um, going to Tasneem's point earlier about the role of civil society organisations, often we have substantial footprints on the ground. So we can provide information uh, quite rapidly and we might have more staff on the ground or greater um, understanding uh, firsthand than many governments will have, even through their intelligence services. The challenge is sometimes when sanctions can inhibit um, uh, the provision of humanitarian assistance. So that might be because uh, governments um, refuse to fund um, uh, programs or services in conflict settings or provide funding for, for NGOs because they think they might be uh, at risk of breaching their own sanctions. So that can limit the ability of providing assistance very rapidly. Um, we, we at times also see uh, de-risking activities uh, by banks and financial institutions. So that has flow on effects for humanitarian organizations. For example, salaries not being able to be paid directly to staff or using third party intermediaries. Uh, and also the lack of support by governments for, for grant appeals. Uh, so they have concerns potentially about um, uh, calling upon support for um, humanitarian uh, causes because they think they themselves also might be in breach. So 
some of these challenges, um, uh, I think, link back to the uh, issues around the framework as it currently exists. And uh, uh, one of those principally is, uh, I think, the lack of a standing humanitarian exemption uh, for sanctions measures. Uh, at the moment, humanitarian organisations are, are having to rely on permits uh, from the Minister of Foreign Affairs. Um, they're often on a case by case basis and they can be very uh, time consuming and inefficient in, in terms of wanting to respond uh, quickly. And that application process uh, can take a, a long period of time. I know that DFAT is going through the process of uh, looking at a humanitarian carve out, but it has been a relatively slow. And if we have time later, I can talk into a little bit more detail about what that should look like. Uh, secondly, I think that there's been a, um, a lack of civil society engagement um, when conflicts happen and in preparation of uh, when conflicts could take uh, place. So that preparatory work that ensures uh, that there is going to be much more of a, a proactive rather than reactive response. Um, some of this uh, we see as a result of the relatively new sanctions measures, but in other cases, we're seeing similar patterns uh, in terms of engagement, whether that's been in Afghanistan or, or Myanmar. Thirdly, uh, I think the other challenge we're seeing as well is the, the intersection between political imperatives um, and humanitarian and human rights uh, in, imperatives. Um, we need to acknowledge uh, that sometimes um, politics and public perception, for example, what might appear on Sky News or in tabloid, uh, might influence the way in which sanctions are applied by governments. Uh, and I think that also needs uh, a greater degree of honesty and transparency from politicians and government officials, uh, because not all sanctions measures are imposed equally and with the same force. And that is a challenge when we look to issues of, of transparency and engagement and can lead to uh, frustration, um, I think, as Tasneem's uh, talked about from uh, the example of Myanmar. Um, but I'll leave it there for now. Thank you. Thanks so much, Simon. Um, turning now to Anton, uh, you have conducted extensive research in relation to Magnitsky sanctions, including compiling a joint report with the International Lawyers Project. According to your research, what kind of impact, if any, have Magnitsky sanctions had on the persons being sanctioned? And what can and should governments, including the Australian government, learn from this kind of um, research? Um, thank you, Mel, and thanks very much for the opportunity to appear here in such uh, excellent company. So maybe to frame that report that you mentioned in a bit more context, um, I suppose when we uh, think about human rights abuse or corruption, there, there is a natural tendency to grasp after every opportunity for accountability, every avenue of accountability. But then at some point you kind of take a step back and think, well, hang on a moment, we're talking about asset freezes and travel bans, you know, that's what Magnitsky sanctions are. Now, what if the people we want to sanction don't have any assets in Australia? And what they don't want, what if they don't want to travel to Australia, or, you know, substitute Australia for any other country in the world that imposes um, sanctions? What is the actual impact of Magnitsky style sanctions, depending on the connection that the sanctioned person might or might not have to that country? So that is the issue that we wanted to explore in a report that I wrote together with the International Lawyers Project in the UK. And the way that we went about it is we looked at the 20 earliest corruption-related designations under the Global Magnitsky Act in the US, which is one of the first instances of Magnitsky-style sanctions being applied internationally. And because that act came into force in 2016, around well, now more than five years, um, seven years has now passed since some of the first designations under the Act. And so we thought, well, actually, time is ripe to look back and try to figure out what happened to people who were on the receiving end of sanctions. Is there any evidence of them having had any assets in the US frozen? Uh, do we know that they wanted to travel to the US but cannot? And then if we move beyond asset freezes and travel bans, what are the second order consequences of sanctions? For example, can we see any evidence of those people having had commercial relations with international companies that then dropped them after they were sanctioned? Are we seeing examples of people um, having lost political power or perhaps um, lost their jobs as a result of sanctions or at least after the imposition of sanctions? So when we looked at that, the uh, findings 
um, you know, obviously are not conclusive in the sense that it's only 20 case studies. So it's not a huge array of people. And it takes an awful lot of time to do that public source research. But what we found is that in approximately half of those cases, we can find evidence of assets actually having been frozen in the United States. So the imposition of those asset freezes was not just a symbolic statement. There was actually something there to freeze. Uh, now, that might not have been much. Uh, we're talking in a lot of those cases about very wealthy people with empires, uh, business empires around the world, and certainly at home, that would not have been affected by those US measures, but at least some um, form of asset freezes will have had an effect. We saw instances, albeit fewer of those, I think around three instances of people having um, faced consequences in terms of not being travel not being able to travel to the US when previously before the imposition of sanctions they would regularly go to the US so we can deduce from that that the travel ban had an impact as well and then it was quite interesting to see how sanctions interacted with prosecutions at home and it was not the relationship that you would expect to see because what you would expect to see is the US imposes Magnitsky style sanctions and then the home country of the individual sanctioned looks at that and says oh boy that's embarrassing that person is accused of corruption or human rights abuse and we haven't investigated actually what happened is it was the other way around so sometimes those people would have been investigated back home first uh, often after a situation of regime change, and then the US would impose sanctions uh, off the back of that domestic action. And that was really interesting because if the purpose of sanctions is to instill accountability, then you should go after situations of impunity. So why do you go after people who have been processed by their domestic justice system? And there are, I suppose, two ways of looking at that. One is to say, those are low-hanging fruit because even their domestic government will not be upset if those people are sanctioned. The domestic government doesn't like those people either. The less cynical view is to say that the US sanctions were, in a sense, a validation of the action of the domestic justice system, where the US government would say, OK, that person has been prosecuted back at home. It's not just a political vendetta. They genuinely are involved in corruption or human rights abuse. That's why we're imposing sanctions against those people on our end. Um, what I will um, mention as a sort of final comment, and one that I think has the greatest uh, potential relevance to Australia and any other sanctioning country, is that in approximately one third of cases, we've seen no observable impact at all. Now, that doesn't mean there's no impact. Maybe we were just not privy to the information that would enable us to ascertain that impact. But the common thread that went through those cases, those six case studies, is that uh, they concerned people who were politicians rather than business people, or at least people who didn't have any particular exposure to the world of international business and commerce. So in a sense, you know, whether or not the US freezes their assets, whether or not foreign banks shun those people is of relatively little consequence to them. And also those people were supported by their domestic governments. So when the sanctions were issued by the US, the governments in those people's home countries would go out there and say, we think those sanctions should not have been imposed. We stand by the person concerned. So you have a combination of little exposure to the world of international business and also a protective stance by the home government. And that tells you something about circumstances when sanctions are relatively less likely to have a pronounced um, impact. So it is a bit of a mixed bag. And I think the message is neither wholly optimistic nor uh, doom and gloom. Um, but I think there are some lessons that could be drawn from that in terms of the design of sanctions. Thanks so much, Anton. Really fascinating research. And I've popped um, a link to the report um, in the group chat, should anyone um, wish to read on that further. Um, Taz, now going back to you, and then you foreshadowed this um, in your previous response, but do you have any reflections on how you think the Australian sanctions framework can be improved and what the future brings for civil society organisations like MCN in advocating for sanctions on specific individuals and entities? Thanks, Melissa. Um, I'm very interested to hear uh, what Simon and Anton have to say about uh, improvements uh, on, on the, the framework. But um, from our understanding, the framework 
already exists for Australia to take swift action um, to address the human rights and, and humanitarian crisis in Myanmar. So whether it's using the Autonomous Sanctions Act or um, the Magnitsky style uh, uh, thematic sanctions, um, it, it seems that it already exists. And I would love to hear what Simon and Anton say, but if we were to use um, Magnitsky style sanctions, um, you know, in terms of the themes, uh, threats to international peace and security, serious violations or serious abuses of human rights, undermining good governance or rule of law. I mean, the, it, it, Myanmar seems to be like a, a case study um, for that. Um, however, the amendments from uh, March uh, 2022 in our anonymous, uh, autonomous, not anonymous, autonomous sanctions regulation, um, there's the expanded scope there to uh, target entities and and different um, individuals and and political parties. Um, so one thing I will say in in regards to the framework, we would like to see better guidance from DFAT regarding the sanctions that have already been imposed on MEC and MEHL. Um, given that those conglomerates have uh, numerous subsidiaries, like at least 106. Um, there needs to be better guidance uh, for Australian businesses and financial institutions to know if they're interacting with any of these subsidiaries. And as far as I know, there isn't that guidance available at the moment. And it is particularly important because Australia is still allowing the uh, importation of goods that fund the uh, the junta through state-owned enterprises. So uh, we're still allowing imports of timber and wood products, pearls and gems and arms and ammunition. Um so yeah, better guidance obviously uh, for Australian businesses and financial institutions, and also to protect Australian consumers from um, uh, you know receiving goods that are um, you know exposed to illegal logging, illegal mining, or human rights violations. Um, Obviously, our perspective is the biggest threat to the people of Myanmar is the Myanmar military. Um, going back to something that Simon said, you know, uh, in terms of delivery of aid, the Myanmar military is actively uh, denying aid to uh, vulnerable communities. So, you know, we do believe that um, removing the Myanmar military is the best way for safe and effective delivery of aid. We also believe that Australia is uniquely placed in regards to our legislation and also our determination, at least on paper, to refuse to interact or engage with the Myanmar military. Whereas other countries in the region and um, ASEAN countries, they're still, they still have uh, development um, with the Myanmar military uh, and they're still engaging, even though ASEAN have said on paper that they are refusing to uh, engage with the, the Myanmar military uh, at a political level, they're still engaging at a political level and they're most certainly engaging uh, on a military le level. So what our, our recommendation to the Australian government would be is to recalibrate their attitude because, <laughs> recalibrate their attitude, that sounds really rude, recalibrate their perspective um, because they um, are encouraging dialogue, uh, they are um, deferring to ASEAN centrality and we believe that, you know, the ASEAN five point consensus has failed and that Australia is uniquely placed to um, as a democratic uh, country in the region to uh, issue sanctions. And I'll just <laughs> I'll just put uh, in a link in the chat. Um, we recently MCN uh, recently sent an open letter to Minister Wong. Um, regarding uh, our recommendations for sanctions. And we have a list of uh, high value targets um, that um, I'll, I'll put the link in the chat, but obviously we're looking at those state owned enterprises. Uh, we're looking at the banking center and cronies, arms manufacturer and procurement, aviation supply chain, junta leadership and the union election commission. And we are very heartened that there is widespread support for sanctions in parliament. And also just recently um, at the Labor conference this year, uh, Janelle Safin, the uh, MP for Lismore, announced a resolution to Labor's platform, which specifically includes uh, commercial entities. Uh, so obviously they're continuing to have sanctions under constant review, but it's very important that they've included those commercial entities. I'll leave it there. Thanks so much, Taz. And uh, it's been really 
wonderful seeing that your consistent effort, MCN's consistent effort to push for these sanctions and the real impact um, that it has had on or it appears to have had on government decision making. And hopefully that uh, will continue um, uh, through your, your ongoing efforts. So um, uh, I'd just like to acknowledge um, the work that you and MCN have done in, in that space, which is um, fantastic. Um, Simon, um, likewise, what changes do you think, if any, need to be made um, to address some of the challenges of Australia's sanctions framework or the way that um, sanctions are imposed and, and how the framework can operate more effectively? Yeah, thanks, Mel. And I think this is a, a really good question to be asking as we're reflecting on two years since the Magnitsky sanctions came into place. And we can really start to evaluate, well, what has been effective, what hasn't been effective, and, and how can we uh, improve the process? Uh, you know, over the last couple of years, there have been more resources provided uh, to DFAT that's given them greater capacity to respond. Of course, the expertise of civil society has increased. Um, events like this are, are, are excellent. Um, you know, we're sharing more knowledge uh, amongst each other. Um, there's greater coordination among international organizations. I think this has all been very uh, positive. I, I think there's still quite a few policy and regulatory measures that could and should be introduced um, to the framework uh, to make sure that it operates uh, more effectively. Uh, as, as Tesney mentioned, there's been a relative underutilization of the framework over the last couple of years, uh, including, I would say, particular thematic areas of focus, which have had more limited attention, um, the category of serious violations of international humanitarian law, which um, is, is an issue um, that Save the Children advocated for very strongly, and so did many other organizations uh, here on, on, on this call. Um, there needs to be some further discussion about the gaps there. Um, there's also been limited application towards entities and military units. But I would begin by, by just going back to the parliamentary inquiry. Uh, uh, there were several recommendations that were put forward during the parliamentary inquiry as to whether Australia should enact Magnitsky uh, legislation. Um, that inquiry over the course of 2020 provided a framework for where we are now. Uh, and there were several measures that were recommended which were not taken up uh, by the government um, at that time. Uh, a couple of those that I think should still be uh, reconsidered is, is firstly the review mechanism uh, in legislation for designations and, and declarations uh, and the appointment of an independent advisory body uh, to um, inform the foreign minister as the decision maker on nominations for targets. Um, that uh, I, um, should include requirements for the decision maker to consider recommendations uh, for the advisory body and uh, give decisions not to adopt recommendations. I think as much as possible, we need to look at those mechanisms such as an advisory body, which wouldn't provide binding recommendations, um, but would help to take some of the politics out of the process of applying sanctions and hopefully give a little bit more transparency. Um, secondly, I think the requirement uh, around uh, providing annual reporting uh, to the parliament on the processes of sanctions, um, enhancing transparency and oversight, I, I, similar to what we've seen in other jurisdictions, I think would be quite effective. Um, in the past, the government has indicated that um, existing parliamentary processes, such as Senate estimates, um, provide appropriate scrutiny. And I, I, I disagree with that. I think that there really needs to be much more engagement um, within parliament and through uh, scrutiny committees and processes about sanctions measures. And I think that will lead to more engagement with um, the process as well. Um, additionally, as I was mentioning earlier, I think there's a need, a very urgent need for a standing humanitarian exemption. Um, as I discussed, during uh, critical moments of um, crisis, uh, say an earthquake, as we saw in Turkey or Syria, there needs to be an immediate um, response and a standing exemption across all current and future human humanitarian um, or autonomous sanctions through a humanitarian form um, would provide better administrative, legal and procedural clarity uh, and limits that sort of the delays that, that can happen. I think there also needs to be a lot more attention on um, the transparency gaps. Some of this is uh, can be implemented through policy reforms. It doesn't require regulatory legislative changes. 
Uh, so principally, I think there needs to be a lot more information on the reason and justification for the use of sanctions. Um, so that includes highlight which international laws uh, have been violated outline which stakeholders were engaged into the decision-making process, what criteria was used. Um, to date, we, we have these two-page um, snapshot briefs on the website, but they lack criteria and evidence. Or when press releases are coming out uh, from the government, um, when sanctions are imposed, there's only a very brief explanation and, and, and rationale. And um, I, I think this really needs to change. Uh, if the Australian government is so proudly committed to the rules-based order, this sort of lack of information about what international laws are being violated, um, I think uh, is, is quite problematic. Uh, also, if we want to demonstrate the imposition of sanctions as to the evidence that's been undertaken, um, outlining the why is, is critical. And I think that's one of the strongest countervailing arguments uh, to authoritarian regimes, uh, to rights violating actors or entities, the Australian government to point to and say, this is clearly, we've conducted the analysis, this is how your actions violate the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights or violate these particular other conventions. And this is why we've decided to impose these sanctions. I would also say there needs to be um, closer coordination um, with civil society organisations to improve uh, responsiveness. Um, we talked just briefly about before, um, and you mentioned, Mel, about that new um, information note um, that's been put up on, on, on the website. I think that's helpful, but the discussion and engagement um, on the role of civil society organisations is still uh, quite limited. Um, one of the gaps I see, and I think this has been an ongoing challenge between civil society organisations and government is um, how should government respond when submissions are provided? And the current guidance note says, well, um, the government will not respond to submissions aside from cons confirming uh, receipt of a submission. And I think that's problematic. Uh, I understand government wouldn't like to speculate on future listings, but I think there's a real risk of disengagement from civil society if organisations are just putting in submissions and they're only going to receive notification rather than having a, a dialogue process. So sitting alongside that, there should be more of that uh, engagement with civil society, of course, through, through meetings, secure communications and consultation. Um, but I think that process is, is, is really uh, um, a, a challenge that needs to be overcome. Uh, and then finally, as I was just, just briefly mentioning before, I think that there needs to be um, more engagement with civil society to consider the role of um, subsidiary holdings, um, particularly with entities, and the role of um, subsidiary units of militaries as well, uh, where they uh, might be involved in uh, of wider spread violations of human rights law and international humanitarian law. And that way, I think it can be a bit more targeted. Um, so we've seen examples of where, for example, the US has done that for div sanctioned divisions, units and, and regiments of, of militaries. So I, I think there's several, several of these measures which would go a long way to ensuring a, a more accountable and transparent sanctions receipt regime that I think would in turn give um, greater cre credibility and uh, much wider support from the civil society community. Thanks so much, Simon. Um, and I know that Safer Children uh, have put in a really um, great uh, submission to um, DFAT while they're undertaking this review of the autonomous sanctions regulations, um, which contains um, uh, some of those recommendations that you've just um, listed. So um, here's really to hoping that um, those recommendations and the recommendations made by other organisations too are taken into account um, in this um, upcoming review and, yeah, really interested to see what um, those potentials are and we'll hopefully, hopefully address some of those issues and challenges. Um, and finally, Anton, in uh, your field of work, what um, are the current focuses of research in terms of sanctions and how do you think such research um, can inform the activities and understandings of governments and civil society organisations so that Magnitsky sanctions can be an important and impactful tool to address serious human rights violations and corruption? From my standpoint, the big ticket issue is sanctions enforcement and 
Um, that relates especially to situations of indirect exposure to sanctioned entities or individuals. And this is something that Tazim and Simon have briefly touched on when they talked about the question of, okay, well, if you deal with the sanctioned Myanmar corporation, uh, okay, well, that your position is pretty clear. What if you deal with a company that might be indirectly controlled by a sanctioned Myanmar corporation? How do you undertake those inquiries? Um, how much due diligence are you supposed to be doing as a bank or another private entity? What is the support that you are get, getting or should be getting from the government in terms of the sharing of information that might help you comply with sanctions? And that applies not only in the corporate context, but also in the context of individual Magnitsky-style sanctions. Um, so, you know, if you're, if you're a bank and you're dealing with Vladimir Putin, okay, well, that's pretty clear. What if you're doing with some random guy from St. Petersburg who happens to be a childhood friend of Vladimir Putin's and is holding assets uh, for the benefit of the sanctioned person? Well, that's a much more difficult situation. How do you undertake the due diligence? And I think one useful way of thinking about this challenge is realizing that when a government is sanctioning hundreds, thousands of people, what it's really doing is pushing out lists of names. Sanctions are lists of names with a bit of identifying information a name, a date of birth, residence, and then it's up to banks and other businesses to figure out if they've got exposure to those sanctioned individuals. And if, for example, you're a bank, you've got to freeze the assets of those people. Well, you know, surprise, those people are not going to hold property in their own names. They will use nominee um, um, account holders, nominee directors, nominee shareholders, and so on. Um, now, you might say, of course, well, it's up to banks and other businesses to investigate whom they're dealing with. But the fact of the matter is they've been bombarded by hundreds and thousands of sanction, sanctions designations under different sanctions programs. And if you operate internationally from different jurisdictions as well, you'll have a, a voluminous U.S. sanctions list, a U.K. sanctions list, an EU sanctions list. And now on top of that, you've got Australian sanctions obligations. So, you know, where do you go from that? Now, one answer that can be provided and that we've seen in some designations in the US is the US will not only sanction the person concerned, but they would also sanction a network of companies and other individuals that they know to be associated with that person. So they would say Anton is sanctioned, but by the way, here's a list of 20 companies that Anton controls, and those companies are sanctioned as well. And here's a list of his friends whom he's using for sanctions evasion, and those people are sanctioned as well. So you kind of sanction the whole network. But that also presents a burden on the government resources because you can't always provide that quality of information in relation to each designation. And then inevitably that onus has been pushed onto the private sector that, you know, kind of you're back to square one because they don't have the resources either. And so I think figuring out that challenge of compliance and defective enforcement in cases of indirect exposure to sanctioned individuals is really an important area of research. And also I think an important area of conversation between the private sector and the government to form some shared expectation of what a good sanctions designation looks like you know maybe sanctions designations should prioritize people with extensive links to the international financial system so that sanctions would be more effective to begin with but also they would not just involve the name and date of birth um, and residence of the person concerned but more information about that corporate network and that would be a more meaningful designation that sanctioning you know 10 people but without that additional level of granularity and i think that links to the point that Simon was making about the criteria, you know, what makes a good sanctions designation. And the Australian government has been remarkably non-committal there. You know, it wouldn't even say obvious things like we're going to sanction people involved in more serious wrongdoing first. We're going to sanction more senior people first. Uh, you know, the UK made statements to that effect. Australia hasn't made those statements. I think that's a missed opportunity. But also another layer to that would be to ask the question of, from the variety of possible targets, who are the people with the greatest exposure to Australia? Who are the people in relation to whom we have the best quality of information? And that, I think, is also a legitimate consideration in deciding whom you sanction as a matter of priority. So to me, those would be the, the two big issues in this context, the enforcement and being clear-eyed about the criteria that you use for sanctions designations.
Brilliant. Thanks so much, Anton. Um, it's actually a really good um, way to segue into questions because the first one we had was from um, Ron Guy um, and he had a question about um, uh, Queensland Bank AGM regarding ESG and procurement policies of companies that they hold in Queensland bank investment portfolio in regards to Myanmar. And I guess that um, reading that question and then th reflecting on what you've said, Anton, um, it goes to perhaps that wider question of um, uh, the difficulties in um, in some uh, businesses, corporations, in being able to identify what is a breach of um, sanction and uh, uh, especially in respect of entities that are not um, directly sanctioned. Um, uh, did you have anything um, further to say? I, I guess I also um, would say that um, uh, it is incumbent on those corporations to um, take those due diligence steps um, to avoid um, uh, breaching Australian sanctions laws. But was there anything else you might add, Anton, in relation to that specifically? So that question brings to mind uh, a really uh, interesting concern that has arisen in the context of uh, Russia sanctions recently in the UK, where there were a couple of cases where one party to a commercial arrangement didn't want to make a payment to another party to that arrangement saying, we have reasons to believe that our counterparty is controlled by a sanctioned Russian individual. And one of the arguments that arose in some of those cases is in an authoritarian system, almost any significant company is ultimately controlled by uh, people at the top. So if you've got a president who's sanctioned, well, you know, guess what? You know, they might control the entirety of the country economy in, in real terms. So how do you deal with that in a sanctions context? And uh, the High Court recently in, I think, the most recent of the two judgments that deal with that matter in the UK said, well, you need to be a bit pragmatic. You can't just assume that everything in Russia is controlled by Vladimir Putin. Uh, you know, that's sort of going a step too far. But I think conceptually, um, there, there is an interesting question there of how do you deal with uh, significant economic entities that operate in an authoritarian context. And yes, you know, maybe today they're not being directly controlled by the government or sanctioned people from the government, but no doubt if they wanted to exercise that control tomorrow, they would get it. Um, I think that's an unsolved question. I don't have an answer for that, but it's really interesting that we've started, uh, you know, we, we start to see that arise in the context of commercial disputes. Thanks, Anton. Um, Ramila Chan Chanishev also um, has a great question in the chat. Um, she asked, uh, or they ask, is there any research on China's genocide of the Uyghurs? And is there any possibility of Chinese officials' crimes against humanity in Xinjiang being sanctioned? Now, when the Magnitsky um, sanctions regulations uh, were adopted, and even before that, um, when being discussed uh, in the parliamentary inquiry, um, many submissions um, referred to the atrocities um, taking place um, in Xinjiang, um, and there were a number of media reports and um, releases by various civil society organisations, including Human Rights Watch, um, calling for um, sanctions on officials responsible, um, but uh, to date there has been no action um, by the Australian government and we of course um, know that um, Australia has a, a um, difficult relationship with China and one that is um, very influenced um, seemingly by the trade um, connections um, that Australia and China have. Um, Simon, maybe I could uh, throw to you because you were involved um, in the advocacy around um, the Magnitsky um, uh, sanctions uh, regulations being um, uh, adopted. Any any reflections on this particular question and, and perhaps on the, the um, uh, irrefutable political aspect of, of these, um, of these uh, sanctions tools? Yeah, really good question, Mel. And um, I 
perhaps I'll answer this a little bit from my personal capacity rather than save the children's um, capacity because I have worked on uh, China human rights issues um, extensively before uh, coming to work for Save the Children. I think just to the first part of um, Ramal, Ramal your, your question, um, there's extensive evidence on on uh, in, in relation to uh, China's uh, genocide of the Uyghurs. There's absolutely no shortage of that. Um, for example, in, in 2021, there was a, a, an unofficial inquiry that was held by a large number of uh, British lawyers, which looked at exactly um, this question. There's a lot of content and, and reporting uh, from Human Rights Watch, Amnesty International, and, and that has um, interestingly garnered uh, some attention from the Chinese government, who sanctioned the, Chi the um, UK lawyers and UK law firms for providing legal advice that indicates that there might be genocide taking place. So that actually goes to this kind of retaliatory role that sometimes um, we're seeing where sanctions being imposed um, by states or even the threat of sanctions being imposed, that some states will use that um, as a retaliatory response. And it kind of goes back to what I was saying earlier, why I think it's so critical and what Anton was talking about um, to justify why sanctions are, are being imposed and outlining um, uh, the criteria, uh, I, I think, is, is, is really critical. So that research uh, needs to be done. Um, but there's no doubt that there are going to be these very sensitive uh, cases where states will look at uh, alternative means uh, to raise these human rights concerns. And that new briefing note from DFAT uh, references that. And so there's a phrase that you'll, you'll often see um, uh, included uh, in government policy making or decision making on these issues. Uh, and uh, it, it, it says, look, sanctions generally are a foreign policy tool, uh, and they will take, take into account uh, all relevant matters. Um, sanctions might not be um, the, the only tool that will be considered in responding to a human rights abuse. So language of that sort. And that was provided a lot of the time during the parliamentary inquiry. It's provided in this guidance note, and DFAT will continue to, to, to say that. Um, so uh, I, I think there are always going to be those situations or environments. And I think for civil society organisations, what that means is ensuring that you have a diversity of advocacy routes to try and achieve your end objective or goal, but also how you coordinate with other um, states as well um, to place pressure uh, on the Australian government, if that's your focus, or other governments. Uh, and the Australian government will communicate with other foreign governments on their um, sanctions uh, measures, and they will take guidance from other governments as well. Um, so there's avenues to pursue that too there. Thanks, Simon. Um, we've got a question from Ong Neng in the chat. Um, what are the obstacles for humanitarian organisations to conduct cross-border cross assistance in Myanmar? Taz, maybe I'll throw to you, although I'm not sure how much um, information you might have. And, and if not, um, I might throw to Simon again. Uh, thank, thanks, Mel. Um, I actually I actually wonder whether or not this this question might be um, more appropriate for, for Simon. Um, and I'm happy to, to for Simon to take that question. Brilliant, Simon. <laughs> Thanks so much. Well, no, no, I'm also very happy for you to provide um, comments. You're you're much more the expert on on what's happening in Myanmar. Um, uh, I, I I think there are often challenges in in cross border um, assistance, humanitarian assistance, where you have ongoing conflict settings, and. The, the challenge is that the environment can change very quickly. I and mean, we've seen that um, uh, just over recent weeks uh, in, in, in the north of, of Myanmar. Um, uh, we saw that, uh, we've seen that in the context of, of, of Syria and Turkey, whether it's um, during conflict there or also um, in the uh, following uh, the earthquake. Uh, so some of the obstacles that you can see around negotiating with different governments, negotiating with local uh, authorities or, or different armed groups, um, and also the engagement of uh, regional governments on a particular conflict setting, and those intractable challenges we're having with the UN Security Council uh, on approving resolutions around ongoing and sustained um, delivery of humanitarian assistance. Um, so it's often very, very challenging. <laughs> 
Thanks very much, Simon. Um, we've got two questions um, in the chat and I thought maybe I would have a go at answering them um, first. So Ted um, Hui asked, there has been authentic reports about Hong Kong officials who abuse human rights in Hong Kong, having um, or hiding extensive assets in Australia directly. What actions should we take for those two for those people to be caught by the Magnitsky Act. Um, and John Della asks, um, also in China, how to encourage sanctions on CCP officials involved in persecution of Falun Gong doctors involved um, in forced organ harvesting. Um, so what I thought I might talk about is the work that ACIJ has been doing in terms of helping um, or assisting uh, civil society organizations to make sanctions um, designation submissions to DFAT. Um, this is something that we have done um, a number of times um, with these or uh, with civil, a variety of civil society organizations who have been involved in documentation and evidence collection and witness testimony. And essentially um, what we do is um, uh, collate that information and then provide a submission to DFAT about how um, those um, violations and those specific um, perpetrators, individuals or entities um, should be sanctioned um, uh, under the uh, Magnitsky sanctions uh, regulations. Um, and so essentially we uh, point to the specific parts of the um, regulations, the legislation, um, which uh, can satisfy the test in that particular scenario. Now, as um, uh, both Simon and Taz um, mentioned earlier, um, the uh, the route to then those sanctions being imposed uh, can be a very long one. Um, and that is because um, the uh, it's entirely within the um, Minister for Foreign Affairs discretion about whether to impose um, those san sanctions, um, considering not only the information presented, um, but also the various uh, foreign policy and other considerations that are very briefly detailed um, on the information note. So I guess to answer those two questions is um, one avenue is um, to, uh, to make those direct and specific and evidence supported submissions um, to DFAT, but also knowing the limitations um, on uh, then being able to um, uh, you know, knowing the limitations in that it's a discretionary foreign policy tool, trying to pursue um, other um, advocacy um, and accountability mechanisms outside of that. So seeing it as just one potential tool um, uh, whilst um, undertaking other action. And Taz, and anything else you might want to add, um, given given your experience in, in this kind of advocacy in relation to Myanmar? Thanks. Thanks very much, Mel. Um, look, in in relation to, I just pop, popped a little um, message in the chat as well, just to um, uh, follow on from what Simon said as well. Um, I think that in relation to Myanmar and 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 potentially with other countries as well, you know, we really do believe that Australia has the capacity to balance our human rights um, obligations and our um, support of democracy with um, our trade relationships as well and what you were saying before um mel in regards to you know china's uh, our, our relationship with china our trade relationship with china i wonder and i speculate how much that has to do with our action or lack of action on myanmar because you know china has just uh re re uh, uh what do you call it um for their, their Belt and uh, Road initial initiative, um, restructured their their loan. So there's a lot of um, Chinese development in Myanmar. There's a lot of um, development from other ASEAN countries, um, Japan as well. How does Australia balance our human rights obligations with our um, growing trade relationships? Um, and I I believe that it is possible. So. Yeah, and that Australia is uniquely placed um, to to take action, whereas other countries are not because of uh, their uh, their interests in Myanmar. Thanks very much, Taz. Um, Simon, did you have anything else on 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 that as well? 
I think, yeah, Mel and Tasname, you both summarized that uh, really well. I think I would just uh, emphasize what you, you were saying at the end there about uh, alternative means. And I don't, um, while it is a really important and valuable framework, you can't place all your faith in DFAT in terms of, and, and, and the Australian government in terms of implementing those sanctions. Uh, and there'll be multiple pressure points. And I say this as somebody who used to work in DFAT as well. There'll be multiple pressure points um, that DFAT and the minister will feel about imposing sanctions. Um, so you also, if in doing your advocacy, need to think about, and this is MCN's been really effective on, on this, um, thinking about your engagement with other parliamentarians, uh, finding champions. Um, uh, there's a, a a lot of ways in which additional content um, can be shared um, privately um, and publicly um, to highlight whether that's what's going on in Hong Kong, whether that's going in China as, um, you know, in response to Ted and, and John's question uh, and Romila's question before. Uh, to demonstrate those links and and the evidence uh, of the sort that, that that Mel is talking about, and that will look very different to a formalised submission um, of the description that Mel's discussing when you're speaking about that publicly or or, or, or privately. Thanks, Simon. Um, unless there are any further questions, um, I'm noting that it is now uh, two o'clock. Um, I might just wrap up the webinar. I would really like to thank um, our expert panelists for their excellent insights, but also for everyone who's joined today, who I know uh, many of you have been working for a very long time um, in this space, um, trying to seek accountability for various rights violations um, and um, also in the sanctions space um, more generally. For anyone who's wishing to stay in touch about developments um, in the uh, in the Magnitsky sanctions space. Um, we do have a very informal Google um, group. Um, I've just popped my email in the chat. Um, if you wish to join um, that group, just send me an email. And further, if um, there's anything you wish to um, follow up uh, about today, or if you're seeking some um, legal advice and assistance um, in relation to sanctions type issues, then happy for um, you to reach out. Um, otherwise, um, unless there's anything further, um, uh, thank you so much um, for everyone for, for joining and um, I hope to stay in touch soon. Thanks very much, Mel. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, thank you everyone. Thanks all. Thanks, everyone. Thank you very much, everyone. Bye.